For decades, the trams were a familiar sight on the streets of London. Then, one day in 1952, they ceased to be, replaced by buses, consigned to the history books along with the handsome cab and the sedan chair. The rails were pulled up and there was little to show for this once extensive system, aside from the odd remnant for the eagle-eyed transport enthusiast. With the obvious exception of this. This is the entrance to the Kingsway Tram Tunnel on Southampton Row in Hoban, looking so well preserved that you could half expect a tram to emerge at any minute. Let's look at the history of this curiosity located in the very heart of London. The first experimental tram lines in London were laid in 1861, and in the 1870s development of a tram network began in earnest. Trams rapidly became popular, particularly with working class passengers. They were comfortable and smooth riding compared to horse-drawn buses, and cheap and convenient compared to trains. In the early days, tram lines were built and operated by private companies. However, in 1891, the London County Council began acquiring some of these companies. The reasons for this were largely political. The council planned to build new housing in the suburbs for working class people, but realised that quick, affordable transport would be essential to the project. A councillor named J. Allen Baker had been particularly impressed by the way things were done in America, where trams, or streetcars as they were known over there, had changed the way cities were structured. He believed that something similar could be done in London, but the tram network would need work. The lines were maintained to different standards, used different modes of traction, and only covered certain areas of the city. The plan was to acquire tram lines, renovate them where necessary, electrify them, and link them together to form a comprehensive network. Meanwhile in Hoban, other changes were afoot. The area was something of a slum back then, a labyrinth of narrow streets with ramshackle houses. A rare survivor of the area as was is the Old Curiosity Shop, and yes, it is that Old Curiosity Shop. A plan was hatched to sweep all that away in favour of a long, broad road, move the locals to the aforementioned new housing, and construct a new junction at Aldwych. The road was to be named Kingsway in honour of King Edward VII. Well, hang on a second, said the tram boys. Can we get in on that? Running a tramway down this road would provide a much needed connection between north and south. In New York and Boston, trams were running through subways, and this seemed like a good idea to the council. It meant more space for road traffic, and trams could avoid busy junctions. So in 1902 they applied to Parliament for permission to build a line from Theobald's Road to the Victoria Embankment, followed by a surface line over Westminster Bridge into South London. There were several objections to the scheme in Parliament, ranging from the practical to the absurd. I think my favourite was the argument that a line through Westminster would make it hard for MPs to get to the St Stephen's Club. I mean, fast affordable transport is one thing, but cocktail hour is quite another. It wouldn't be until 1906 that all the required permissions were attained for the full line the council wanted. Construction of the subway was actually surprisingly straightforward once the obstacles had been worked out. Because Kingsway was being built at the same time as the subway, it was easy for the construction teams to work around each other. At the same time, gas and water mains could also be laid. The track descended at Theobald's Road. The first section of tunnel was in tubes passing under the buried River Fleet. Then it rose up again at Hoban to just below street level, constructed using the cut and cover method. It continued under Aldwych, emerging at Waterloo Bridge, here. There would be two stations, at Hoban and Aldwych. There was a later proposal to build a third station at Wellington Street, but that was abandoned. The station at Hoban would incorporate a connection to the underground. At the time, many of the trams in London were still horse-drawn, but those running through the subway would be electric. Power was picked up from a conduit between the rails, the authorities objecting to overhead wires through Westminster. But because the trams didn't have to share the road, the track could be laid more lightly in a way that made maintenance easier. Trams in London were usually double-decked, but having to dive under the fleet posed a problem. The council's engineers believed that the gradient needed for a double-deck tram to get from below the fleet to street level would be far too steep. So a shallower gradient was built and special single-deck cars were ordered. 
At the insistence of the Board of Trade, these had to be completely fireproof, and were constructed in steel and aluminium. One councillor did suggest open cars be provided for the benefit of smokers, but this idea seems not to have been taken too seriously. On the 24th of February 1906, the first trams ran through the subway. The line from Theobald's Road to Angel had been electrified to provide an onward connection, and Angel to Aldwych was the first service. In 1908, the tram lines to the south of the subway were fully completed, enabling services to be run into South London and up to Tower Bridge. The tunnel was a success. In fact, in some ways, it was too successful. By the 1920s, the size of the tunnel was proving limiting. The LCC wanted to provide more services, but that was hard when the majority of London trams couldn't use the major north-south link. There was also a maintenance issue. The tram works was in Charlton in south-east London. The only way double-deckers could get there was by going west to Putney Bridge, then all the way through south London. So in 1929 it was announced that the subway would be rebuilt to take larger trams. In some places the floor was lowered, and in others the roof was raised. The fleet was actually diverted to avoid the gradient issue. New trams, the E3 class, were ordered. The reopened tunnel opened on the 5th of January 1931. A tram, appropriately number 1931, was especially painted white for the reopening, and it ran in that livery for some months. Legend has it that it was repainted in the standard livery after a group of drunks mistook it for a ghost, but I suspect it had more to do with the difficulty of keeping a white tram looking clean in a dusty tunnel. The double-deckers found the gradient at the northern end difficult. The ever-cynical Railway Gazette described trams using it as having the grace of a performing elephant on roller skates. On the way up, they often stalled on the section and sometimes even rolled back into the tunnel. Sparks would be thrown up as they struggled, and it sort of proves the Board of Trade's point about fireproofing. In 1932, a new experimental tram, number one, entered service. This had air-powered doors and folding steps for use in the tunnel. It didn't catch on, partly because trams were already looking a little old-fashioned compared to buses, but it has been preserved at the National Tramway Museum at Kreich. In 1933, an administrative change. The LCC trams fell under the control of London Transport. In 1937, more upheaval. Or should that be downheaval? In the 1930s, it was determined that Waterloo Bridge would need to be rebuilt. Construction began in 1937, but the war held up completion until 1945. No matter for our purposes, though. What the rebuild meant was that the southern end of the tunnel had to be moved, a new one opening directly under the bridge. Or rather, where the bridge would eventually be. The exit is still there, but now it's a bar. Yet even at this stage, the tram's days were numbered. Buses had proved their worth over the last couple of decades, and it seemed almost certain that they would replace trams in the not-too-distant future. In 1939, an experimental trolley bus was tried out, with doors on the offside so that it could use Hoban Tram Station. It was not a success. I guess my big question would be, how would you power it without overhead wires? I doubt the batteries would have been suitable for the whole journey. The war and the austerity period meant that replacement of the trams took rather longer than planned. New buses intended to replace the trams were diverted to replace, well, other buses that had been knocked out by the war. When I said that the trams' days were numbered, it was actually a pretty high number. Wholesale replacement of trams did not really begin until 1950. By this time, trolley buses were also seen as something of a dead end. Motor buses were unsuitable for use in the subway due to fumes, so it would have to go. And buses would have to share Kingsway with other traffic and negotiate busy junctions. Exactly what the tunnel was built to avoid. That's progress for you. On the 6th of April 1952, in the early hours, the final trams ran through the tunnel. Some would go to other cities to live out their last days. The rest to the scrapyard. Elsewhere in London, trams would hold out until the 5th of July. Not that the tunnel would see no further use. In 1953, it was used to store buses and coaches for the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. In 1957, it was used as a store by a company called S.G. Young. 
The Greater London Council would use it for flood control headquarters until that was made obsolete with the opening of the Thames Barrier in 1984. But given how car-centric urban planning was in the post-war years, it will come as no surprise whatsoever to learn that two of the ideas for reusing it revolved around cars. One was to turn it into a car park, this didn't go ahead. The other, which did, was the Strand Underpass, a means for cars to duck under Aldwych. This was approved in 1958, opened in 1964, and it's still there. But it only covers the southern part of the tunnel. The northern part is still there, very much as it was in 1952. It's been used for various things over the years, as a store, as an exhibition space, and as a film location. Most recently as the Bat Cave in The Batman. A 2016 proposal would have seen a cycle track built through it, which is ironic because bicycles and trams are natural enemies. As of 2021, it's been possible to go on guided tours through part of the tunnel, which is now Grade 2 listed. I strongly recommend it if you get the chance. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If so, please do leave a like to let YouTube know, and perhaps you might like to subscribe for more. I would like to thank my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon, and here on YouTube for your ever generous support. You are the folding steps to my tram station. And I'll see you all again very soon. Cheerio.